Content warning, today's episode of Hollow Victories contains mentions of domestic abuse. Welcome, movie fans, to another episode of Hollow Victories, where we answer the age-old question, which movie about a child plotting to murder an abusive step-parent is funnier? I'm Matt Present, joined as always by my elderly co-host... Justice. My name is Justice, but you can call me Michael. <laughs> so, fun fact for the people at home... Um, Michael is exactly two weeks older than I am, and we are recording <laughs> this in the very brief period where Michael is technically a different age than I am. So, w- when is your birthday? Uh, on Wednesday. Oh, cool. Next oh, Wednesday. wow. And mine was on a Wednesday, too. So, literally two weeks. Yes. Yeah. You literally two weeks. Damn, son. Well, by that time, this episode will be out. So, happy birthday, Matt. Uh,. uh this episode will not be out when that happens. I mean, by the after that. I wait, after that, I meant to say. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I've been drinking a little bit. The, these two did it to me. Matt, <laughs> the, it's like, these two are more fun than a lot of the movies we've watched on the show so far. But this, these, it, it just like, I, I told you this right before we hit record. I'm going to repeat it. So many of these movies we watch on the show so far, I know it's still a pretty new show. Still fairly new show. A lot of them feel like they're hitting a lot of the same beats, though, in terms of badness. These two being the first two original movies that we're covering, I just feel like they found such unique ways to be shit. Oh, absolutely. I, honestly, the the biggest problem, I think, with both of these movies is the writing. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, they do a lot of stuff well, but the yeah. writing just goes completely off the rails. And I said this before, and I'll say it now. They have my respect in some regard because it's like, clearly these two are someone's baby. This is something that someone, someone cared about these two. And that to me is, I feel a little worse roast in something like that. Cause it's like, I feel like the the director of like Dragon Ball Evolution, I don't, I don't know how they feel about it, but they're probably, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think they have to feel too bad about that sort of thing. It's just a bad adaptation. They were director for hire. They Probably did not have full creative control over the project. It's whatever, right? Yeah. Some something like Book of Henry or Serenity. I, I feel like if you you I feel it feels like someone put their fucking soul into it and it just didn't come out right. It, it, they just missed the mark. They were they were blind to something that everybody else could see. And I feel bad for about that because I feel like that could I do feel like that could happen to anyone. Um, I do feel like. It, I mean, I say that, but there are some directors that I like every movie they make. But I, I feel like it's it's certainly possible it could happen to me one day if I made a movie. You know, I get so connected yeah. to it. and But I'm just like, and I'm so connected to it that I'm blind to something that literally anyone else could tell me is not good. Absolutely. Uh, I, I agree. The, these were passion projects. These aren't Marmaduke and Garfield which was just like the studio shitting something out. These were movies people made on purpose. I mean, Marmaduke was too, but but the rest of them are bad. Well, which one do you want to start with? Let's start with Serenity first. Let's just go in the order that we watched them in. We watched Serenity last right. night. The, the order of these is completely arbitrary, episode <laughs> to episode. Um, <laughs> so Serenity is the story of... Matthew McConaughey as a, a a fisherman boat fisher guy, he was a a big war hero. Uh, but and then after the war, he kind of he divorced his wife, and he moved out to this island to catch fish, run a tourist fishing boat. Um, and all the time he's trying to catch this giant tuna. This is it's just this giant tuna right off the coast that's been, like, taunting him since he got there. So his, his like, only goal in life is to catch this tuna. Well, as it happens, his ex-wife shows up with her new husband or boyfriend. They're, they're not super clear on the relationship there. Her new male partner... Uh, who is quite abusive, uh, both to her and to Matthew McConaughey's son. So she's like, hey, I'll pay you 
like ten million dollars. It was it ten million or ten thousand? It was a lot 10, of money. Ten, ten million. Ten million. I'll pay you a lot of money if you like get him drunk, take him out to sea, and just sort of, you know, let him go overboard. Yeah. You know, never hear from him again. Uh, all the while, Matthew McConaughey is like communicating with his son in unclear ways, which leads up to. A completely bizarre twist. <laughs> and here we should probably say spoilers for both of these movies. Yeah. Because we have been spoiling the other movies, but I don't feel like that matters that much when you're talking about, like, I don't know, a, it's a Marmaduke or any of these. But Serenity, Serenity and Book of Henry are both hilarious movies, so I would highly recommend you watch both of these unspoiled. Before you proceed. You better stop shit-talking Marmaduke, I swear to God. <laughs> so, about an hour into the movie, it's revealed that Matthew McConaughey is living inside a video game that his son programmed. Uh, and And he has programmed his stepfather into the game in the hopes that his video game father will kill the stepfather. This leads to Matthew McConaughey offing the stepfather, and at the same time Matthew McConaughey is offing the stepfather, the, si the son, we see like a shot POV from inside the computer. The son picks up a knife, walks out of the room, murders his stepfather and then walks back in and keeps playing the video game. So, yeah. Immediate major flaw I want to mention with this movie. It had to have been R-rated, right? Like, there's no... They say fuck yeah. in the movie. It has to be an R-rated. Yes. They do not show the death of... His name's Frank, played by Jason Clark. And I feel like that's kind of the whole point of his character. It's just every single time he opens your mouth, you're like, wow, it'd be fun to watch this guy die. Because, yeah, they, they just make him the most unlikable person possible in like in every scene he's in. Yeah. I mean, my God. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just every single time he opens his mouth, it's like not subtle at all. You're just you are supposed to hate every single thing that comes out of this guy's mouth. So it might at the very least, it might be nice to see, like, you know, the knife go through his neck or into his stomach or something like that. But no, it's off screen. It's off screen. The shark death is also kind of off screen. You see him like go overboard, but you know, it's a rated R movie. You can show some gore. Come on. You're going to have all this build up. Do I sound like a fucking psychopath right now? No, I'm with you. It's <laughs> like, like, like the kid doesn't really get super close to the computer screen after killing the stepfather, but it doesn't seem like he has any like blood on him. Yeah. And even if he did have blood on him, I would still say that's kind of a cop-out. But yeah, there, it doesn't really look like there's any blood on him. Man, I... You, you kind of mentioned that both of these movies like are fairly well shot before, and I 100% I agree. I think that the director of photography for this movie did a pretty decent job. I can't say the cinematography feels like super meaningful in any way. Yeah, they do this weird, like... Like, circling people shot several yeah. times. What the fuck was that about? Is that because I, it's like... Is that supposed to be like, oh, it's a video game, so weird move? I, that doesn't really work for that. It's just yeah. like... What the fuck was that? That was awful. I don't, I don't think it was bad. It was just like... It, it had no purpose. Yeah, it's, it's just like... It, ooh, look at the cool camera thing we can do. It, it's like awful in the sense that it's just distracting. Like, there's other movies... Like... Where there's other movies, like, I don't know, under a different context, it could be a good effect if it actually, like, had a purpose. We watched Upgrade recently at, on one of our movie nights, and that one does some really weird stuff with the camera. But it has so much purpose when it does it, you know? Yeah. In this movie, it's also doing, I mean, you know, it's, it's different from Upgrade, but just in terms of, like, weird camera movement. I don't get why they did it. It just kind of feels like, hey, wouldn't this be a cool shot? I mean, yeah, but why? Why are you doing it? Yeah, I, th I think a lot of the directors and cinematographers can sort of get caught up in that, like, ooh, it looks cool and different, and it's like, 
Yeah, but you gotta have a little purpose behind it, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I do think that there's some very lovely shots in this movie. The set in, that they shot it on was a nice looking place. Like, some of the, just most of the shots of the fucking ocean look so nice, because it's not just blue water. You can see, like, some of the sand underneath. You can see, like, there, there's just some really detailed shots in this film that look really fucking nice. Really, really nice. Um, but it, it just kind of feels like the entire time you're watching it, it doesn't really, a lot of it doesn't really stand out too much. Excuse me, I'm repeating myself now, but it's just, I don't know, finding a way to shoot, especially since now you're saying like, oh, this world is like a simulated world. There's some shots you could come up with to go with that, to go along with that, to kind of make it feel more like this place doesn't really exist at the end they do some special effects to kind of pull off that effect i don't know yeah maybe maybe you start to have the character notice some things visually once he starts to realize that his life is a game i mean mm, i i definitely have issues with the twist but i let's let's put a pin in that come back to that one yeah i mean if you're Um, gonna if you're gonna do it though Throwing some, throwing some neat shots for it. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to mention the director, Stephen Knight. Um, yes. Who, who directed a movie called Locke that is fucking brilliant. I love Locke so much, and I'm really disappointed this was his follow-up. Mm-hmm. So this, there is good stuff going on in this movie. He, I, I'm not going to argue like, ooh, he's, he's totally fallen off as a director, but it's like... Wow, this like doesn't work. Where Locke, L- Locke is a basically a movie where Tom Hardy is in his car, and that's where the whole movie takes place. The whole plot is revealed through phone calls, and that's a concept that could go wrong very easily, but he nails it. He makes it work, mm-hmm. and I think this is also a concept that could go wrong very easily. And it did. I, I, yeah, I think so. I think that the twist is really silly. It's really hard to take seriously. Here's the thing. I feel like they project, like, like once you know what the twist is going to be, they project it really hard. It's, it, it seems like really obvious that that's going to be the twist, except it's the most batshit insane twist like, you could never predict that that was going to happen until yeah. it happens. Yeah. One, one thing that I was talking to you about last night that I think a lot of directors fall under when they want to throw in a twist into their movies is they come up with the twist first and then write a movie around it. Yeah. Um, And I think that can hurt them. They, they think of a really cool way they could fool the audience. And then they have to write a movie still. Where a good movie... Like, if you knew the ending of The Sixth Sense or The Usual Suspects, it should still be, a a good movie should still be good if you know the twist, if it's spoiled for you. If you know how The Usual Suspects ends, if you know how The Sixth Sense ends, it should still be a movie that's worth watching, because the rest of it should be good too. Whereas a lot of movies, it's just like, they come up with a cool twist, and then they have nothing. Be fair, this isn't a cool twist, I (laughs) I don't think so. But they think of something in their head, and it's like, that could be a cool way to... That that could probably fool the audience. That could probably... Uh, that could probably catch them off guard. And then they write a movie around it, and it's just... You know, it doesn't... Mm-hmm. doesn't quite work. Uh, Bruce Willis is Kaiser Soze. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. The twist doesn't work, and then when you know the twist... It seems like they're projecting it really hard, even though you know no one is ever going to guess that that's the twist. Yeah. Because there's there's just frequent lines throughout the movie where it's like... Just like weird moments throughout the movie where it's like, it couldn't possibly be anything else. Right? Like, there's a point where... Like, uh, Anne Hathaway, who's the ex-wife in the movie... She's like, oh, he talks to you through his computer screen. And it's like, and, and that happens frequently throughout the movie. So you're, it's kind of like either these two have a psychic link 
or Matthew McConaughey is living inside his computer. Yeah, and it's like I I saw that and I was like thinking, okay, my 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 initial thought was like, okay, the kid is dead or something, and his ghost is talking to him, or the spirit lives on in the boat or something, or something like that. Something stupid like that, because one, I knew that there was a stupid twist in the movie, but it was just like the whole, that everything's a video game. Yeah, that that's just, that's such a stupid, ridiculous idea, especially in a movie like this, that I just, yeah, I didn't see that coming. It, it doesn't give you much of a reason to see it coming. And I guess they do have lines in there that blatantly say what it is by like saying like, yeah, he's talking to you through a computer like that, but it's like. But you, your mind goes somewhere else because it's like, surely it's not going to be that stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like if you just had a movie and throughout it, the characters were like, wow, it'd be really weird if we were suddenly attacked by giant frogs. And then it ends with them suddenly getting attacked by giant frogs. It's like, what? I, I, I didn't expect that to happen. But on the <laughs> other hand, you really projected it. <laughs> oh. uh, I think... Th- th- even beyond the twist, because obviously the twist doesn't work. I think, I think the twist could maybe work if this were a little cheesier. Mm-hmm. If they were, if it was kind of a little more tongue in cheek, there was more comedy to it. Yeah, it kind of be like, whoa, hey, he's in a video game, wild man. I think that this and Book of Henry have a plot that might work better as a comedy. Than a drama, but these two movies are taking their stories very um, seriously. Book of Henry for sure. Serenity, I don't know if it it could work as like a full comedy, just maybe a more comedic film than it is. Yeah, it needs yeah, to be a little that. sillier to pull off a twist that silly. Because like Matthew McConaughey and like Anne Hathaway are playing it very straight the entire yeah. time, and that's the thing. Like the the. The twist certainly makes it stand out, but outside of that, this movie is so, like, (laughs) overdramatic. Like, there's a a scene where uh, Anne Hathaway approaches him in the bar, and it's like the most cliché dialogue you could think of. It's like, (laughs) if, if you were writing, like, a TV show, and someone in the show was watching an overly dramatic movie... You could use this exact dialogue. It could be a fake show being made in BoJack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like BoJack could be in that scene. Yeah. It's like, why? <laughs> oh, man. I uh, Should we talk about the cast for a bit? Uh, yes, because this does have a pretty star-studded cast. Yeah, we've already talked about Jason Clark, who plays the role of the person you want dead the entire movie. Yeah, and he's not bad in yeah, he's, that role. He's I not mean, bad, but the script is really bad. They don't yeah. like it's just like every line has to reinforce how much of a douchebag he is. I think that stronger if you want to make a good character like if you want to make a good asshole character, I almost feel like it's better to make like find something likable about them first to make it like to give, like, other characters a reason to not hate the guy. Yeah. And then you see how he treats his family. I feel like they actually do pull that off of Dean Norris in the other movie, although that though, there's that comes with its own problems, because Dean Norris is... That character is not very good in that char- in that movie, but we'll get to it. Yeah. Um, Matthew McConaughey is the lead here, and I like Matthew McConaughey well enough, but... He seems really full of himself in this movie, especially. There's a lot of Matthew McConaughey nudity in this movie. He spends, (laughs) like, a third of the movie, like, shirtless or completely naked. There's several ass shots. There's even a shot where you can maybe see his penis. It's sort Mm. of silhouetted, but he's, like, diving (laughs) naked underwater, and it's like... Is there some penis there? I can't tell. Maybe he's got some, like, stage prop thing that hides his penis a little. But it's like, Matthew McConaughey is as old as my dad. Like, he doesn't need to be doing 
topless nude scenes anymore. I get it. Back in the 90s, McConaughey was a hot dude. He can do nude scenes in the 90s. He could probably get away with them in the 2000s, too. But uh, at this point, the man is too old to be doing this much nudity in a movie. But Matt, the ocean scene was so metaphorical and beautiful because he was in the ocean and his son was there too and they were naked and... Oh yeah, hold on. Can we talk about how the son programmed several sex scenes into this game about his father, including one between his father and mother? And you could make make and you could make the argument that that was him wishing that they'd get back together, even though it's really fucking weird. But no, it's a revenge fuck. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> this kid is fucked up. I uh, get. I mean, he he does murder his stepdad at the end of the movie, but yeah. like, yeah. that's almost forgivable given everything we know about the stepdad. Like, I, I can excuse that far more than I can him deciding his dad wants to revenge fuck his mom. Yeah, it's so weird because it's like, do you want us to like this guy? Me and Mit because Mit Mitzi joined us last night for that. We were like so back and forth on that scene on whether this was a good thing that was happening or not. And then he pulls out and just says like, all right, there, I've won. And it's like, okay, no, he's in it. He's a douchebag. And he, and here's the thing, Anne Hathaway is a bad, per her character in the digital world, the digital version of her, is a bad person too, but it's just like, okay, I don't like you either now. You're both bad people now. Uh, yeah, Anne Hathaway's the ex-wife, don't have much to say about her, she's fine. I, uh, I, I, I did not enjoy her character, I felt like they were trying to make her really deep, but it was just like... I don't, I don't have anything against Anne Hathaway, because I was asking you guys last night if Anne Hathaway's been in anything good. I can't think of that many things, but I also haven't seen her in much. I do think she made a good Catwoman, but it was a bad script. Um, but she could easily work as that character. Um, yeah. As for Serenity, it's just like, I feel like she just had, I, I mentioned this last night, she has like the same face on the entire movie. She's just, and I understand, like, it's like a, her character is kind of like a sad character. She's being abused and she wants, you know, she wants her um, current husband or boyfriend or whatever out of the picture. But I just, I, I don't think they, I don't think, it, I don't, I don't think the script gave her much to work with. So I don't really blame her for it. But there wasn't a lot to her character. It kind of felt yeah. like it kind of felt like manipulation. Like, uh, you, you, oh, you have to feel bad for her. You have to see her as a character because this ser really serious thing is going on with her. Mm -hmm. Um, rather than actually writing a character, you know. Yeah. Um, you've got. I am almost certain I'm gonna mispronounce this, so bear with me. Jaman Husanso Husansu. Yeah. Maybe? I, I know who you're talking about. He played Duke. Um, yeah, he plays Duke in this movie. Uh, famous for playing Korath in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Yes. Um, re recurring character in the MCU, actually. He also plays two different characters in the DCEU. <laughs> <laughs> he, he plays a character in Shazam and Aquaman. Uh, who does he play in Shazam? Uh, he's the wizard. Oh yeah, I do remember him. I love Shazam. I haven't seen Aquaman. I enjoy Aquaman. It's not good, but it's it's definitely the most fun movie in the DCEU outside of like Shazam. Like it's it's the most funny bad movie. Yeah, Shazam is good. DCU. Yeah, Shazam is good. Aquaman is like funny bad. We got we got to find someone to pair Aquaman up with one day. <laughs> the Lighthouse. <laughs> They're both movies starring uh, Willem Dafoe where a lighthouse worker fucks a mermaid. Aquaman Will versus the lighthouse. Willem Dafoe's an Aquaman? Yes, he is. What the fuck? I didn't know that. <laughs> uh. Uh, anyways. Yeah, uh, no, The Lighthouse was a shitty movie. Good movies have color. <laughs> it's in... It's in 
3 by 4 aspect ratio, you know we have full screen televisions now. <sighs> Anyways, uh, the actor who plays Duke, um, he does pretty good in this movie, I think. He's one of the most likable characters. Yeah, you know. Because he's like... He's, like, actively trying to stop McConaughey from murdering someone. The, that, but, like, it's kind of actually sad with him, too, because it's, like, you, you kind of see him as his one genuine friend as the movie's going on, but you hit a point. I guess Constance, too. Um, yeah. The uh, But the funny thing with him, though, is, like, you kind of, like, see him as, like, a genuine friend throughout the whole movie, and then at the end it kind of becomes clear that he's just part of the same rule set, which we need to get to fucking Reed Miller played by Jeremy Strong, the highest quality character in the movie. Um, uh. <laughs> Duke, uh, it's kind of, I actually do think that's like a decent moment where it's just like you learn, okay, he's not any different from anyone else here. He wants him to follow a rule set. So it's like this one person he trusts as a friend, even though he's not a good fucking friend to Duke at all. He treats him like shit, um, makes it very hard to like him. <laughs> But, uh, but it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of the scene where it's like, this guy is, he, he you know, Duke, you, you, you see him as a true friend throughout the movie, but at the end, it's like, he's just another person who's trying to prevent him. He's like, yeah, he's just another person in this town that doesn't want him to kill Frank, even though Frank needs to die. Yeah. <laughs> There's no reason not to kill Frank. At least not that is presented in the movie. Just kill Frank. Come on, everybody... Even Frank wants you to kill Frank. We we did have the discussion that, like, it, it seems like the kid is kind of conflicted about killing Frank IRL, and so he's trying to see if, like, maybe he can talk his virtual dad down from it. And I think the fact that, like, his virtual dad goes through with it is what inspires him to go through with it. Yeah. That's clearly what I feel like. That's like the main reason, uh, Mister Stephen Knight wanted to make this movie, and I can see it. I could see that being like you know, the it's a really harsh thing to focus on the idea of doing something, trying to convince yourself to do a bad thing for a good reason. Um, I can understand why this director made this movie. I just think that there was a lot of missteps along the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyone else in the cast we want to talk about? Diane Lane plays Constance. Oh, she is likable enough. Very corny dialogue. Extremely corny dialogue. But, you know, seems like a genuine friend. Her whole role is like sugar mama for Matthew McConaughey. Seems like a genuine fuck buddy. <laughs> Which, uh... You know, kid programmed a sugar mama for his dad. <laughs> you really gotta, like, think about what this kid uh, is doing sometimes. We, we should probably mention, uh, at the end of the movie, it's revealed that Matthew McConaughey is dead in real life. So, yeah, that's why he's been programmed into the game. Yes. Um, and he's, like, the main character of the game, too. Yes. I think... I th is he, is the kid playing as Matthew McConaughey, or are all of the characters sort of autonomous and he's just, like, writing the code? Has has this kid programmed, like, artificial intelligence? Maybe this kid just programmed Tamadachi life with murder. <laughs> I would say with murder and fishing, but no, Tamadachi life has fishing. So yeah, that's let's just say that. That's that's my head canon at least. <laughs> All right. I wanted to talk about Jeremy Strong as Reed Miller, the guy in the suit who's just constantly trying to track him down. Every single shot with that character is fucking hilarious. <laughs> the first shot is just him like taking his shoes off and then walking into the ocean. Then the next shot he's on a bus and it's just going past him. He's like staring staring down Matthew McConaughey. And you just kind of keep seeing it's it's just like Synecdoche, New York, with like Hayden's impersonator, his stalker. It's just as clever. This movie is just like Synecdoche, New York. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this this is this is our generation Synecdoche, New York. Yes. 
even though that movie's not that old. I mean, I was probably 11 when that movie came out. 11 or 12. Yeah, I mean, this movie is 10 years more recent than Synecdoche. Yeah. Jeez. Anything else about this movie? Oh, man, I feel like there was something, but uh, I definitely feel like we've talked about it enough. Yeah, I Uh, mean... It's... I see what they were... I kind of see what he was going for. I think that it was something that was true to this director's heart, and I feel... I see, like, the, you know, real-life connection it's trying to make between you know, hard decision-making, I guess, in a situation as serious as this. I do think maybe it's a little bit of an irresponsible message, but it's kind of, I don't know, because it's like, I do think Frank should die. I do think he should die. It's just like, this kid's kind of a prodigy and he's throwing his life away now. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, they're saying, like, they kind of established that, like, it doesn't really matter what they, it's kind of like how in that it's kind of like how in Book of Henry, it's like he's being, you know, the person, they have a line that explains, like, oh, I can't just go to the police, he's, he's above all that, you know, he's, yeah. this, this is the power he has, it's like, it's rough, you know, it's, that, I don't know. But that's the thing, in Book of Henry, they at least try to explain, like, oh yeah, you can't go to the police, we don't know if this guy has gone to the police or not. He could just be killing someone for no reason. Plus, I mean, the kid has all this technology. I feel like he could just, like, turn on a webcam. You can hear the shit going on in the background. Hey, here's some evidence that I did this. If you want to go further, I think he's probably smart enough to sneak a camera and actually show his dad so it's not just audio. If this is really happening every single fucking day, you could probably capture it. But here's the problem. We don't see enough of the kid to know what is actually going on in his life. You know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's just kind of a bummer because the kid is clearly, you know, he's like, just like we're, it, this movie is about two child prodigies. He has a potentially really bright future that he kind of throws away. And yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that's... I would consider that one of the film's biggest problems, is the kid is sort of the central focus of the movie, and yet he's in almost none of it. He says, like, oh, yeah. two lines in the movie. At least Book of Henry, and I have different problems with Book of Henry, so don't take this as me giving the win to Book of Henry. Oh my god, we'll get to Book of Henry. But at least Book of Henry, Henry is a character yeah. that we focus on. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, there's... Serenity is trying, but it it falls short in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, you want to move on to Book of Henry? Yeah, let's move on to Book of Henry. Introduce. Oh, that's my job to introduce that's, Book of Henry. I've introduced Book of Henry before on this channel. I want to hear how you describe it. Book of Henry, directed by Colin Trevorrow in 2017. Uh, starring Jaden Martell as Henry and Naomi Watts as his mother. And just, I wanted to make this, this is a point I made to Matt, this is a point I want to make to you guys. Uh, currently, Naomi Watts is the queen of Hall of Victories because she has been in two of these movies now. She was also in Tank Girl. I, I'm pretty sure she's the only one who's been in two of them so far. Is there anyone who's voiced one of the dogs in Marmaduke? Uh, I didn't do this on purpose, for the record. I didn't realize Naomi Watts was in both of these movies. <laughs> oh, I know. It's just like, event. I think we. I want to keep track of that. I want to keep track of the actor who star, who's in, not, doesn't have to be star and role, just who's in the most of these. So if I've gotten this wrong and someone in the audience picks up on that, that someone else has actually appeared in two of these, go ahead. But I, t- I looked into it a little bit today. I'm pretty sure that Naomi Watts is the only one who's been in two so far. So Naomi Watts is currently wearing the crown. So far as I can tell, yes. Unless there's, like, some incredibly... Like, one actor in two very minor roles. Yeah, I think we'll ignore it. If you If someone in the comments wants to point it out, go, absolutely go for it. But I I think you can ignore that for, like, very minor roles. I mean, they, they have to have at least have some sort of significance in the movie. Um, This movie is about a child prodigy who's just a genius and good at everything just ever everything Th- throwing everything um he understands henry medical stuff 
as good as the doctor. Even yes, though he's he, 11. He's really good at building things and coming up with plans. And honestly, you can, I think you can, I think that's reasonable. Like his constructive side. Cause my brother was also very crafty as a kid. I've witnessed that. And my brother wasn't as smart as Henry. So Henry is just a little bit more advanced. That's okay. That works. But then they also have to make him, yes, a medical expert. He also knows, like, his mom's financial situation. He's also able to predict what people are going to say in the future. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is just, he's just Jesus, basically. <laughs> Get used to it. Um, and, you know, first half of the movies kind of focus on him and... His, you know, you, you get some time to know him. You get to know, like, what his situation with his brother is, what his situation with his mom is, how he helps his mom, how his mom is somewhat more childish. The movie, Matt, you you had some crit- critiques of that. We'll get to that with how the movie kind of portrays the mom in, like, in somewhat negative way. But it's, uh, like, saying, like, oh, she's irresponsible. She drinks, she curses. But it's like, no, she's a good mom. <laughs> She's a pretty good mom throughout the movie, but at the same time, I don't think the movie's really arguing that either. It's just, uh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, so getting back on track, first half of the movie, it's mainly just focusing on Henry again, you, letting you to get to know these characters, but also introducing this idea that their next door neighbor, um, the, his next door neighbor is a girl that Henry possibly has a crush on, but is also very concerned about. Because she is clearly being abused by her father, played by Dean Norris, who honestly is a good casting choice. The script doesn't really work well, but Dean Norris, honestly, <laughs> it's not a bad choice for that character. And, he, and he's really worried and he gets he's really frustrated that like he lives in a world where someone can be a, like, you know, they, there can be some obvious abuse going on and no one's doing anything about it. Um, and he wants to take action. and He starts taking action. He starts making some sort of plan on how to on how he's going to take, you know, you know, save the day, take out Dean Norris. But then he re- finds out, he like kind of starts having the seizures at night and you learn that he has a brain tumor and that he does not have much time to live at all. Um, and he starts just trying to write down everything that he can, every like all of his plans to give to his mom and brother on how they're going to deal with the future. And halfway through the movie, he passes away. And then the second half of the movie is about how Naomi Watts is going to is going to kill Dean Norris based on her son's plans. Yes. And it gets really silly and it gets really ridiculous and it's a lot of fun and it's really frustrating at the same time. And yeah, the second half of the movie is a murder plot <laughs> on killing the abusive father next door. So it comes it goes right back to murder and a step parent just like Serenity did. Yes. Um and you really start to see why Matt paired these two together. <laughs> Perhaps that's the real twist of this Hollow Victories. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said last time, it's the story of two precocious kids that both get derailed in the exact same direction. Murder. <laughs> yes. Oh my god, I love Book of Henry. <laughs> I kept saying it i'm sorry for cutting you off and please after this i'll shut up for a while to let you go on because i just went on i told you when we were watching it that i this is a really really bad movie (laughs) i did have a lot of fun watching it i did i did genuinely have a lot of fun watching it. this movie is a complete fucking mess (laughs) (laughs) it's like Here's the thing. Apparently, Colin Trevorrow has been kicking this script around since, like, the 90s? So, he's he's had this one for a while, and it does kind of feel overwritten. Like, too much is going on. Like, there are ideas he had, and then he's like, wait, that doesn't make sense. And then he just, like, kind of slightly alters the script just a little to make it make a little more sense. I almost wonder if the first draft of this movie didn't have Henry dying. If Henry was the one who was going to go through with the plan. And then at some point he's just like, ah, fuck, Henry can't buy a gun. He's 11. What was, I, what was Henry's- I can believe that was always part of the plan. What was Henry's plan if he didn't die? How was Henry going to get a gun? Because he, he finds out about, like, uh, uh, Dominique, the the secret name you gotta drop at the gun shop to get the illegal stuff. Yeah. But 
Like, well, even even if he drops Dominique's name, no one is going to sell to a fucking 11-year-old. It's up for debate if the director thought that far ahead, because the director could have always had it in his head that Henry was going to die. <laughs> and that that part, and that Henry just didn't have that part figured out yet. But Henry is supposed to be like a child genius who plans everything out ahead, and it's just like, how are you going to get a gun, Henry? <laughs> Well, we'll think about it this way. Maybe this plan wasn't fully in action yet. He didn't have the whole plan figured out yet. And then when he found out he was dying, as tragic as that is, he was like, that's it. My mom's going to do it. Also, his plan is to dump Glenn's body in the creek, which is a very shallow creek and would not be a yeah. good place to dump a body. It wouldn't be. I remember that one kid, like his brother, saying, like, if I go any further, then I'm going to fall into the creek. And it's like... Okay, the creek's a puddle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's... it. it clearly, there's a lot that isn't thought out. I'm justifying that one part, but there's not a lot I can justify. <laughs> yeah, it's not a great plan. And... Spoilers. Uh, Henry's mom doesn't go through with it. At the last second, she sees some pictures of Henry. And is like, oh wait, you're 11! You don't get to decide if I murder someone. I probably shouldn't listen to you. And I, she made the right call. Give her that. And, uh... But it it doesn't matter because then neighbor Glenn kills himself. Uh, because... Because he knows, yeah. Because his daughter did an... Or his stepdaughter did an interpretive dance and the... The, the principal of the school was like, wow, clearly this girl is being abused. Time to finally do something about it. You know, if the police station, if they would have just told him, like, don't, if they would have just told him why there was a case being made against it, he wouldn't have killed himself. Because if they would have told him, like, oh, yeah, your daughter did an interpretive dance. Oh, my God, that would have been an easy thing to argue against. <laughs> well, <laughs> my favorite fucking scene in this movie is like so so henry first discovers like oh the neighbor girl is being abused the next day at school it's some kid's birthday and his mom brought donuts and the girl is like oh i don't want to eat the donut and henry sees that gets up leaves class bursts into the principal's office and is just like God damn it, Janet. How long does this have to go on? And it's like, Henry, you've known about this less than 24 hours. What are you talking about? <laughs> I love their fucking back and forth. It's like watching a fucking detective movie, like cop movie. Yeah. A major problem with this movie is that Henry is not written like a child. He's written like an adult. And, and that's the point, but it's still, like... That that happens in other movies, but it, it creates so many awkward situations in this movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's, there's that one. There's the scene later where he's, like, dying, and he and Sarah Silverman are, like, flirting with each other. And it's, like, clearly the intention with that scene... Is that it, it's supposed to be a wholesome moment. It's supposed to be Sarah Silverman being like, just just trying to make the kid feel better, I guess. It's it's really, that's where I feel like I would have had some self-awareness with what I was making. Yeah, yeah, it just feels a little, because their banter from the start is very like, oh, y'all gonna fuck? But that's the point where it's like, <laughs> Holy shit, y'all are gonna fuck. He's 11. Sarah, please. And, like, it's clearly being done in a way where it's supposed to be, like, not really. It's, like, it's just kind of a joke. It's it's supposed to be treated in an innocent enough way, but it's, like, you can't do a shot where Sarah Silverman kisses the kid and not have <laughs> have this come up as a topic. Yeah. Come on. It's so it's so fucking weird. It yeah. they they mi they missed like the mark by like a thousand percent there. It was just so fucking off. Oh, it's like the 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 pitcher threw the ball 
and they accidentally hit themselves in the face <laughs> with the bat. There's there's so much to talk about with this movie. It's hard to even know what to touch on next. Oh man, um, actors. Uh, we can talk about actors. Naomi Watts, of course, is in it. She's fine. Yeah. It's a little over the over dramatic in some scenes. There's scenes where I'm supposed to be crying, and it's just, I'm sorry, you lost me. But I think you can be a good actor in other things. Uh, Jaden Martell, good actor. I don't blame yeah. him for, he, for a kid actor, honestly. Hen, you couldn't have done Henry any better. The 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 no. script wouldn't the script wouldn't allow it. And he was also in, yeah, as we talked about when we were watching it. It. Did a good job in it. Yeah, he's in It. Chapter he's 1 and in, 2. He's in Knives Out. Good in Knives Out, even though it's a small character. Yeah. Um, he he plays live-action Morty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Recently. Yeah, yeah it's, that's fun. As For a child actor, he is a good actor. I, I will give him a lot of credit. Um, and he, he does a good job in this movie. Like, like, we talk about Henry is not written like a child, but, you know... He pulls it off. Yeah, it's kind of, and that kind of makes it funnier. It's because yeah. it, it's like he does a good job, and it makes it worse. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it's like it, it just shows how how much this character doesn't work. Um, because he because of how well he's pulling it off. Um, Peter, I, I'm looking up the actor's name, Jacob, Jacob Tremblay. Tremblay. I've, um, oh, I didn't fun. note it, you know, he's, he's so young and I think there's scenes where he's doing fine. And then it's like, I feel he, it's, it's he's, not his fault. It's the people who casted him, but there's a scene where he has to cry when his brother's dying. It's like, it's not good. I feel bad. It's the, it's the director. They hired a cute kid instead of, instead of a kid who could act. It's, it's, <laughs> I feel bad about that because it might affect him later in life. Uh, he's he I, well he was just in Luca he was Luca was so, he okay good good because so, that people people really liked that yeah he he was also the kid in room with uh, Brie Larson so okay uh, he's he's definitely still got a career um, that's good I, I think all the actors in this probably still have careers ahead of them or if if they don't it wasn't this movie's fault um, yeah I. I think casting a kid who genuinely can't act is, like, bad. That's a bad thing to do. Um, But he's not too bad in this. It's just the scene where he has to cry. It's, like, it's not good. But I can't... I don't want to go hard on the kid. I want to go hard on the people who made that a scene. Um, Dean Norris plays a cop because Dean Norris always plays a fucking cop. He's really good for those characters, and I think that there were parts in this movie where he fitted the role really well. It's just the script is working against him. I say they can. I think that Dean Norris is an intimidating actor because he is like, yeah, he does always play a cop because he looks like a cop. So he, yeah, he just kind of comes off as intimidating and kind, you know, kind of dickish, and it's like... It's funny, because he plays, like, such a similar character in everything he makes, and then he <laughs> acts totally different than that in real life. Yeah. <laughs> like he seems, I think he's a good actor. He seems like... He, he's really funny, honestly. He, he seems like he's, a nice dude. He does, and he's, like, typecasted, you know, but... Yeah. But he plays those roles really well, and he yes, plays... he does. And he... And he played Hank in Breaking Bad, and you know what? That's a good fucking performance. Yeah, no, he he is Hank. He's the perfect yeah. Hank. Yeah. Yeah, and then in, like, uh... In this movie, it, like, there's scenes where it's working, and then there's scenes where it's really weird, because the, it gets confused in the script, because every single scene where he's, con- where he's talking to Naomi Watts, who, her, her name is Henry in this... Wait, her name, wait, wait, why does it say her name is Henry on... What? Are you looking? Is her name is her name Henry too? The girl, the neighbor girl. Her name is Christine. Naomi. No, Naomi Watts. Uh, Susan. Her name is Susan. They have her listed as Henry Carpenter on Google. Well, (laughs) Susan. 
Yeah, Google did fuck up. I, that, that caught me off guard. I was about to call her Henry, even though that's like literally the character's named after. Um, the, um, no, Susan. Every single scene he interacts with Susan, he seems like a fucking serial killer. <laughs> but then any scene where he's interacting with other police officers or child protective services, he seems like a nice fucking guy. And that's good because it's like kind of what the other movie failed to do. It's like kind of making him seem like a nice person. So it's even more hard to accept that he's a piece of shit. Yeah. Um, so why, but what's the thing with Naomi Watts? If you want, I mean, maybe it could make sense if he had like a creepy thing with her, but no, he doesn't. (laughs) He's just, it's so weird. He just turns into a serial killer character then, but it's not his fault. It's the script's fault because the script makes it really eerie. You know who does have a thing with her, but also doesn't have a thing with her? The hot doctor. (laughs) Yeah. Who, what the fuck was that about? That was so unnecessary. Yeah, he, like, the the doctor that was taking care of Henry, who's, you know, hot doctor, and he's kind of flirting with Naomi Watts, and then later he shows up at their house to, like, make sure they're okay, and then Peter invites him to the talent show at the end of the movie. And he shows up for that, and then he just sort of disappears. There's no... There's not even, like, a, it, hey, let's get coffee, like, implying they're gonna get together later. They just don't get together. Yeah. It just... There's no reason for him to be in this movie. He works fine in the scenes where Henry's in the hospital as a character for Henry to go off of. Like, he doesn't want him to be condescending to him because he knows more than doctors do because he's a genius. <laughs> um... No, but, like, in th- those scenes, he's f- fine. You know, he comes off as really sympathetic. He he works in those scenes, you know, for the most part. It's not like, it's not like he's a great character, but it, it, it works. And then they bring him back into it. It feels like he, the director had an idea and didn't have time to go through with it. Yeah. That's what it seems like. It seems like if this movie was three hours long, for example... Maybe not even three hours long. If this movie was two hours, two hours and 15 minutes... There could have been something with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but there isn't. So he's just kind of awkwardly there. Because um, um, it's like he's a doctor character who, who who feels bad for this family after Henry dies. But again, and I said this to you before, and it's going to sound, it sounds harsh. But if he is a doctor who's dealing with cancer patients, you know, this has to be something that he's somewhat used to. He's not going to try to, like, communicate with every single family member of a patient that dies. You do your job and you try to make things as, you know, comfort and as you can as you're doing the job. But you don't necessarily go to the talent show of the kids. Yeah, that that part was weird. Uh, It was a child that died, so I get sort of checking up on the family, maybe. That makes a little sense to me. But, yeah, just showing up to the talent show just because Peter invited him. If if Naomi Watson invited him, I'd get it, because, you know, he, he's trying to hook up. But it's uh, just a kid, and it's like, uh, I don't know if, about that. And then we have Jackson Nichol as Morris, who's the kid who wants to be a dodgeball player. <laughs> And then he's sad that Henry's gone, even though Henry shit on his dreams of being a professional dodgeball player. And then he does a rap at the end. Can we talk Best about, character. Can we talk about Henry being such a fucking dick? Like, he's a dick to that kid. But and he, he gives this whole speech about, like, oh, what's important in life isn't, like, money. It's about, like, what you mean to the people around you. And then when he's dying, he's all only concerned about, like, money and, like, Mom, bring me the financial statements. And it's like, Henry, take your own fucking advice, dude. I, get, I, I mean, that's actually a part that I can kind of get. It's like, I feel like when we get in a desperate situation like that, we almost do forget our own advice. Um, because it's like he's, he's, trying, he's trying to be there for family. He's trying to make their situation better. I get what they were going for. But it's just that that just goes into so many of the film's other problems with this kid not being a kid. Yeah, you mentioned it a little, but I want to elaborate. Like, he's always sort of 
naysaying his mom and, like, kind of making it seem like she's an irresponsible mother because, you know, she gets drunk with her friends once and she plays video games. And it's like, Henry, she's taking care of you and your brother. She is not neglecting you. She is feeding you. She's working a job that apparently she doesn't even need to work because you guys yeah. have a lot of money. So Henry's like, literally telling her not to go to work. Yeah, it's like, in what way is she an irresponsible parent? Fuck off, Henry. Let your mom drink. Let her play video games. <laughs> yeah, no, she's she is not a bad mother. That's with with every with all the problems that this movie has. That is something that you can give her throughout the whole movie. She's not a that, bad mother. She she says the right thing when Peter is like saying it should have been him. You know. Yeah. It, it almost feels like, like they wanted her to be, like, not a great mother, but they weren't ready to commit to it because they also wanted her to be a good mother. Yeah. Right, like, so, so her flaws have to be very minor, basic things. There is a scene in the movie where I feel like the director's intentions were, like, almost shown. There was still some awkwardness. There was still some problems. But it is the scene where Henry dies. Because the way they did it, it was just, like... It's still awkward. It's still overly dramatic. It's still, like, I'm having a hard time to... It's special, and it's also just, like, all of the stuff that happened before it. I feel like if the movie had been good up to that point the way that they had written Henry off, like, that final scene would have worked. I think that that would have been an okay to go, okay way to go about it if everything up until that point had worked, you know? I can agree to that. And, because then you also get these, sh the very next shot, it goes to black after she's holding him in her arms. And then you just get this, I, remember, I actually remember the shot still, it's like the staircase shot where she's just like sitting underneath the staircase to their house. And it's like this really fucking gloomy shot and the way the music goes with it and the shadows of the shot and the way it was composed. It's really effective and it's clearly one of those moments that the director made the movie for. It's one of those moments that mattered to the director so much Yeah, where it's like if everything else worked, this would be a it's a good scene. It's a good scene. It's in the middle of a really ridiculous film. Um, yeah. And that, and that hurts it. That, that is, but it is like this kind of sincere moment, which I don't think I got out of any of the other things that we watched on the show. And I, I, and I can, I can respect that. Get to give, to give him a little bit of props. I can respect that. Um, we should give nod to the director here, Colin Trevorrow. Because this is the film that got him kicked off of Star Wars. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was slated to direct Episode Nine, and then this movie fucking bombed. And they're like, nope, we're giving it back to J.J. Abrams. And I don't know that he could have done worse than J.J. Abrams. Hey, Colin Trevorrow, as far as I'm concerned, you probably could have done that last Star Wars movie better. <laughs> I, I didn't watch the last Star Wars movie. I, I skipped it. You, you don't need to. Episode nine is not good, and I, it's it's pretty universally agreed upon as not good. Like people were really split on the first two, and then the last one is just like, nah, yeah, no, nah, fuck this. I think that's the real beauty of the series. Uh, episode, uh, I, th I think, in, in a way, the sequel trilogy is the best trilogy because it tells the story of humanity, where the first one came out and everyone was blinded by nostalgia. The second one came out and it was split down the middle. Some people loving it and some people hating it more than any other. Like, some people saying it was that the prequels were better. And then finally you have this final movie that comes out where everyone's like, Okay, this was bad. <laughs> this was a bad idea. This didn't work. <laughs> uh, let's not get into Star Wars discourse too much here. And the world was at peace. <laughs> um, God damn. I mean, 
There's more stuff I could talk about, but it'd all be minor stuff. I w- okay, hold on. There's one Go thing. Ahead. One thing I think we should talk about. So early in the movie, there's a scene where Peter is upset because he was getting bullied at school. I I was hoping this would be it. <laughs> and to to cheer him up, Henry like pours a bunch of like uh, detergent flakes everywhere and. Acts like he's, like, climbing up a mountain and there's all this snow blowing around. Just to cheer him up. Which, first off, seems really out of character for Henry. Henry is not, like, a fun, jovial character. He is a very uptight character. But that's supposed to be like, oh, look, Henry is fun. People like Henry. No, they (laughs) don't. But... (laughs) It's it's a very small moment, and it's very... He loved his brother. It's, it, yeah, it's a small moment, and it's a nice moment, but it's really easy to forget in the chaos of everything else that happens in this movie. Yeah. And then you get to, you get to the end of the movie at the talent show. Peter's gonna do a magic trick, and he's like, I'm gonna make my brother appear before everyone. And for, for a minute, you're like... Did Henry fake his own death? Is Henry actually <laughs> alive and is going to pop out of this chest? Because I wouldn't put it past this movie. This movie is so buck wild. That could have happened. Instead, he opens the trunk and he kicks it and, like, uh, soap flakes go everywhere. And everyone applauds, even though they have no context for what that means. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> It doesn't make any fucking sense, I mean, unless this is just something he does all the fucking time and everyone hates him because he gets shit all over the place all the time. Yeah, no, I did not remember that you had to remind me of it when we were watching the yeah. movie. Yeah, uh, there is the unintended implication that he's blowing Henry's ashes over everyone. <laughs> um, Yay! But, I, I don't know, I think... The point of the scene is like, oh, I'm going to make Henry reappear, and then, oh, here's this, like, little thing that reminds us of how fun Henry was. Henry wasn't fun. That was a totally out-of-character moment, and (laughs) one that is very easy to forget in the context of the movie. And it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Like, that's supposed to be heartfelt. That's supposed to be, like, some big emotional payoff. And it doesn't work even a little bit. No. It really doesn't. <sighs> Anything else? No, I'm good. I mean, it, I, I, we said this about... So we kind of said this already, but, like... Yeah, it's well shot. Yeah, no, there's stuff about it I can respect. I, I, I think that... In terms of purpose... It has more purpose in the shot selection than Serenity did. Yeah. And... I, I feel like it is trying to have a message. There is there is some idea at its core about, like, you know, uh, the, the legacy we leave behind. Yeah. But it doesn't work. The film's a mess. The dialogue's cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> it goes completely off the rails. And I guess we've reached the end of it, and now we have to vote on which one of these movies is better. So, I I guess it's my turn to vote first. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. If I had to watch one of these movies again, I would rather watch Book of Henry. Because I think Book of Henry is hilarious. I love it to death. That's not to say I wouldn't watch Serenity again. I just love Book of Henry. It's a really funny movie. That being said, if we're going to talk about which movie is better... I don't think I can pick Book of Henry over Serenity. Even though I enjoy it more, I also enjoy Serenity, and I feel like Serenity comes closer to being a good movie. You would have to do less work to make Serenity a good movie. So I am voting for Serenity. Hmm. I am gonna go with Book of Henry. Alright. And and it's partially because I feel like both movies are well pretty well shot. 
I think that Book of Henry's has a little bit... I think it kind of has things down a little better. It has a good set with that bedroom. It has a good set with that treehouse like, that they built in the woods. So I think there's a little bit more like thought that's being put into the sets and the cinematography in Book of Henry. I think that there's one scene that genuinely could be good if the rest of the movie was good. It's kind of like a good scene trapped in a bad movie, so it also kind of comes off as bad. Um, I think that there's bet some like I think that the actor who played Henry w- it, he did a fine job. It was just a horrible, horrible script. Um, and I think that Book of Henry has its I- understands its own identity more. I, under- I think it understands what it's trying to do better. It's missing the mark entirely. But fucking Serenity, I, I had a fun time watching that one too. I actually would watch that one again with someone. Um, because I do watch bad movies with like my cousins sometimes or some of my friends. Um I I think both of these movies are candidates for that for like a night in the future. But I do find Book of Henry funnier too, just like you said, I do like it more. But I also think it both are so bad and maybe Serenity. I don't know. I don't know. It's very hard. It was. I. I was on the line the entire time. Uh, um. I. I get where you're coming from. Because going into this, I kind of expected to pick Book of Henry because I remember yeah. Book of Henry being funnier. But I'm. I'm trying to be the slightest bit objective and be like, okay, I think Serenity is and more I... of a good movie. And I'm trying to be somewhat objective, too, because it's like, I yeah. think in terms of ridiculousness, Book of Henry goes beyond Serenity. I think in terms of, like, the dumbest fucking thing they could come up with, Book of Henry, Henry, Henry surpasses Serenity. And I think if it weren't for the fact that both movies were well shot, Serenity would have it. Because then they would have the technical side, too. But I think both movies are pretty well shot. I think both movies are pretty well made. And then I think Book of Henry has a scene in it that it's like, okay, I this the scene's actually kind of all right, but it also understands what it's going for more. Where Serenity halfway through it changes what it is, and the twist doesn't make any fucking sense. And Book of Henry, I, it's so awkward, and it's such an <laughs> the the entire movie is really awkward. Yeah, I think Book of Henry is also more consistent in a sense. All right. That's fair. Um, I'm all over the place with this. Clearly, I yeah, I it, it was very close between these two. Yes, I do think Book of Henry is a little better. Um, this is the closest poll we've had. I I checked yeah. I checked up on it, uh, about a week ago, I guess, and it was fifty fifty split. I I sent you a f- picture of that. Yep, it has changed. There is a winner. I was really worried we might have to declare this one a tie. But there is a definitive winner. With 60% of the vote, it's Serenity. But it's a very close vote. Damn. It's 60-40. This, f- this is my first loss, guys. Well, I lost <laughs> in the first episode. <laughs> my winning streak is over. Serenity wins! All right. Uh, so next episode, not much to set up. You already know what we're talking about this time. Uh, but next month is December, obviously, so we're gonna do a Christmas episode. And we, we had to pick the two worst animated films we possibly could. Yes. It's The Christmas Tree versus Rhapsody Street Kids Believe in Santa. This is gonna be a fun one. <laughs> it's that thing Nostalgia Critic reviewed versus that thing Rebel Taxi reviewed. I think Nostalgia Critic has talked about Rhapsody Street Kids. Did he? <laughs> uh... I'm gonna say Rebel Taxi beat him to it because I think oh, Rebel absolutely. Taxi was kind of. He was like the first. Yes, Rebel Taxi was the first. First popular, at least. First popular person to talk about it. Maybe there was something. It could be like a... Yeah. Couldn't you say that you talked about Food Fight first, or th- or did you miss the mark? I didn't talk about it first. I found it first. I found gotcha. Food Fight like six months before JonTron reviewed it. But that was before I had a YouTube channel, so I didn't... 
talk about it. I just watched it before it was popular. Yeah. Man, you could have had you could have been a million subscribers <laughs> by now. It's all yeah. because of Food Fight. So next episode I think will be interesting just because I feel like this is like this one this week was the first original two movies we talked about mm-hmm. and this and these these next two will also be original movies so we're, we're kind of creating a good balance here but um also i think this next week is going to be like we're we're hitting like the really low tier <laughs> movies you know oh yeah I mean, this is yeah. this is like when you we're we're, we're we're like hitting like ding this is like kind of when you're hitting dingo picture levels dingo picture i would probably put like at the bottom of the barrel like it's absolutely the lowest point and this is when you're getting really close to that point, yeah you know? yeah um the show is very much for like more popular bad movies which these two yeah. definitely are yeah that there's a level of popularity that uh, goes into these picks. Um, before we wrap up here, I do want to say, if you have any suggestions for Hollow Victories, go ahead and leave them in the comments. Um, we, we have several planned out, so and, and several very obvious ones picked out, so you might even pick one we're already planning on doing. But I would like to hear the suggestions. I keep forgetting to ask for suggestions. I intended to the last couple episodes and didn't yeah no i love uh i love checking out the comments so if you leave a comment i'll i'll i'll, I'll look at it. i might even respond uh please like yeah i absolutely love hearing feedback um and if you if you give a suggestion that we like maybe it will maybe it will happen but later in the line but maybe you'll like suggest something that's so fucking perfect that it happens sooner mm-hmm. so always worth going for it I've also neglected to ask you if you have anything you want to plug. I do put your channel at the end card and in the description, but anything else? No, that's, no, that's good. I, I, I think that's a better thing to ask for guests because I get my link every episode, so no worries. Okay. Click click on Michael's face. It should be popping up right now. Yeah. Um, or in the description if you're having difficulties with that. Yeah. Um and until next time for my co-host Mackle, I'm Matt Presents. Uh see you in the next one. Peace.